Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the questions that I'm often asked, because I am a seminary professor and a leader in my church, is what can we do to save our church? What can we do to save our congregation? It is a pressing question in a time when overall belief in God is waning and churches seem to be on the decline. The first thing we should all do, of course, is quit trying to save the church and just live wildly and freely into the freedom that Christ's resurrection and the Spirit's outpouring at Pentecost have given to all of us. And as we die, so shall we live. And as Christ lives, so shall we also live. So we need to quit looking inward and trying to save ourselves and live boldly and freely outwardly, living out our faith in daily life. But there are other questions to this, other answers to this question also of how do we save our church. And over the years, through constant and I hope careful study of the Word of God, God has managed to hammer a few ideas along that line into my head. And this passage from Mark contains what I take to be one of the most important of all those ideas. Let me name it as clearly as I can. One thing that the church can do to live wildly and boldly into the freedom of the resurrection is to relearn the ancient evangelical habit of being Christ's sent guests who rely on the hospitality of the stranger. When I was graduating from seminary in 1991, the great movement of the church at that time was all about welcoming the strangers. Churches such as Willowbrook in Chicago and scholars such as Patrick Kiefert, who wrote a book called Welcoming the Stranger, they were teaching the church of the 1990s to relearn the ancient practice of showing hospitality to strangers. In that day, spiritual seekers were still showing up at worship to check out churches. And then churches, by first transforming the experience to being welcoming, and then second, showing active hospitality to guests. And third, by actively following up with seekers, congregations could grow. And it worked for me in the early years of my ministry. I call that the attractional model of ministry, but that attractional model of ministry, of being the ones who show hospitalities to strangers, doesn't have much um, thread left on the tire, not much tread left. And experts within the church are announcing that the attractional hospitality model of congregational outreach is dead. New neighbors of different religions or of no religions who grew up participating in other faiths or no faith at all, they don't seek out Christian worship when, uh, when they're looking for community or looking for God. So what then should the church do? A hint in today's gospel reading from Mark 6 points us in the direction of relearning the even more evangelical and equally ancient practice of going to the stranger as people sent by Christ and learning to be guests who rely on the hospitality of strangers. And as we bring the peace of the reign of God to them, what we see in Mark 6 is that the kingdom of God is manifest. For years I was puzzled by Mark 6. By Jesus' instruction to the twelve as he sent them out to take no bread, no bag, and no money in their belts. Yes, they could wear sandals, but not to take two tunics with them. What was that about? And Jesus said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place, meaning the village. Why no bread, no bag, no money? Why not two tunics? This puzzled me for years until I came to understand that Jesus was sending out the twelve to bring the peace of the kingdom and to do ministry, the ministry of the reign of Christ. And in order that they might do it, they needed to learn to rely as guests on the hospitality of strangers. And it was dangerous, of course. Christ says elsewhere, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. It was about Christ's followers learning to cross purity and ethnicity barriers and then to remain in whatever house they entered. And of course, as Luke adds in his version of this story of the sending out of the 70, eat whatever they provide. Don't worry about keeping kosher. 
Don't be picky about what you eat. Eat with them whatever they serve. And this was really a radical statement in Jesus' time. Just eat whatever is put in front of you. Because Jesus was just starting out his movement. There were no people seeking the kingdom of God to, by going to church as visitors because, of course, there were no churches to visit, obviously. So instead, Jesus sent the 12 and later the 70 and later Peter, Paul, and Mary and the rest of the apostles out as sent guests who had to rely on the hospitality of the stranger. And in that encounter, the encounter of Christ's sent guests relying on the hospitality of the stranger, the kingdom of God was manifested over and over and over again, and the kingdom grew. As the sent were hosted and given hospitality by the stranger, the sent one and the welcoming one manifest the kingdom of God for each other. And to the extent that the church can relearn to do that, the kingdom will once again be manifested over and over and over. And I want to take you back to the example of Elijah. If you're up for a more radical picture of what this looks like, Consider the story of the great prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 17 through 19 with me for a moment. I'm not sure how well you know the story, so let me retell it a little bit. Elijah was a prophet in Israel when Israel's king had married a foreign princess who became Queen Jezebel. And she brought with her uh, many of the worst practices of ancient idolatry, including, we are told, child sacrifice and later self-mutilation. Therefore, God called and sent the prophet Elijah to speak a drought into existence. The result? A famine that endangered the entire land, including Elijah. So God sent the new prophet to his first call along the Carrot or Charit River to live as a guest there, relying on the hospitality of ravens who bring him bread and meat twice a day. Now, there's a couple interpretive options to try to understand who were these ravens. Um, were they literally ravens? That's the first option. If so, they were unclean animals. And, and the bread, of course, that they brought to Elijah to sustain him in those years of his first call in ministry were most likely roadkill, because that's what ravens eat, bits and morsels from the dead animals upon which the ravens feed. I mean, the ravens didn't exactly fly to the nearest uh, Trader Joseph's where they loaded up their reusable shopping bags uh, with, you know, uh, organic vegetables and locally sourced, sustainably harvested chickens, right? If these were ravens, they were bringing Elijah roadkill. Now talk about whatever, talk about eating whatever is putting in, put in front of you. On the other hand, the, it's also possible that the term raven, which in Hebrew is very close to the word Arab, was a racialized term for the nomadic Bedouins, the Ishmaelites perhaps, who would stop to, get, uh, to draw water at the uh, Karit River. And if so, Elijah may actually um, have preferred, rather than relying on the hospitality of Bedouins, to be fed by actual ravens rather than human ravens. But either way, after time, because of the drought, the Karit River ran dry. And with the well literally dry, those Bedouin ravens quit coming there for water. And so God sent the young prophet for a second call to Sidon. Now that's the very land of Queen Jezebel, to rely there as a guest on the hospitality of a woman. And the woman had almost nothing, just a little flour and a little oil, enough to make one biscuit. Nevertheless, she welcomed the prophet and the kingdom of God was manifest by turning scarcity into abundance. She had intended to eat that biscuit and then die, but the sent prophet and the woman who welcomed him manifested the kingdom of God for each other. And for years, that jar of flour didn't run out and the little pitcher of oil was not spent. And all of this happened as the sent prophet relied as guest on the hospitality of the stranger. And at the end of the story, the woman says, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. 
Now, if we were continue, if we were to continue Elijah's story in chapter 18, he has to learn to rely on the hospitality of a man named Obadiah, who hid him and other prophets in a cave. And then in chapter 19, while fleeing from Jezebel, Elijah has to rely on the hospitality of angels. Now, notice the flip on how uh, our usual way of thinking about hospitality is, is working. Thinking of the time that Abraham had welcomed three strangers uh, who turned out to be angels, the book of Hebrew tells us, remember to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some have unknowingly entertained angels. Elijah's story is the flip. He had to learn to be the guest of ravens, of a foreign widow, of a fellow Israelite, Obadiah, and even finally of angels. Brothers and sisters, I cannot promise that Christ's ancient and evangelical command will be easy or comfortable or safe. Most of us are much more comfortable hosting strangers in our own spaces than we are in going out and relying as a guest on the hospitality of strangers. But Christ promises that as we do so, we and the strangers who host us will manifest the kingdom of God for each other. So get out of your walls, get out of your house, out of your church, go and greet the neighbor, enter their houses if you are welcomed, and may you and they manifest God for each other so that the peace of the reign of Christ might rule. To the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.